Hello. All right. So let's get started. So welcome everyone. So welcome to the tutorial on interpretable machine learning for computer vision. So I'm Bodhi Zhou from MIT. So I will be your moderator today. So today we have four speakers in I. They will cover a broad and diverse topics relevant to interpretable machine learning. Of course, not limited to deep learning. So we have Bing King from Google Brain, Lawrence van der Metten from Facebook AI Research, me from MIT, and uh, Andrea Verdadi from Oxford University. So let's get started. So our first speaker is Bing King. Bing is a research scientist uh, in Google Brain. Previously, she got her PhD from MIT. And uh, she will give a tutorial on the overview of interpretable machine learning and the different level of interpretability. So let's work on Bing. Thank you. Happy to be here. And for Swati, should I put this on? You have already put it. It's on. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Super excited to be here. My first CVPR ever. It's a great conference so far. So for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about interpretable machine learning. Beam Kim, Google Brain, you heard it. Let's start the talk with XKCD cartoon. Why not? A friend is building a machine learning system. The other friend asks, is this yours? Yep, you pour data into this big bag uh, pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Well, you just start the pile until they start looking, looking right. How many people in this room think that there's some truth in this cartoon? Right, let's be honest. Exactly, I think so too. And is this a problem? Yes, machine learning is a powerful hammer and we use this hammer to solve a lot of problems from making money to saving lives. People love it and there's a whole hype and industry around it which we are part of. Unfortunately, this powerful hammer is a little bit complicated for humans to understand. We don't even have to think about neural network to talk about complexity. Just think about building a linear classifier on 100 features. As you start to scan 100 floating numbers, it starts to get mind boggling. When you use this complex tool, you don't really understand, but you use it anyway, you might do something that you didn't quite intend to. And machine learning community has been responding to this need of having methods to better gain insight into machine learning models. And it is also important to note that this is not a new problem. Expert systems in 80s, lots of complex systems before that already identified that communicating something complex to humans is hard. So why now? What's different now? Two things. Complexity and prevalence. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of computers. They're cheaper than ever. We use these computers to compute a lot of things. And that helps us to increasingly uh, increase the complexity of the model that we can use. And we use this complex model to do a lot of things. It's hard to go, go by one day without interacting with something that is powered by machine learning. So let's address some burning question first. You probably heard that decision trees are interpretable. And if it is, maybe we shouldn't be having this tutorial. Maybe we should just go home and or have a beer outside. But we're scientists, so let's, let's do a little experiment to see if this is true. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you a tree, one tree at a time. And I would like you to follow the tree given what is true at this moment. So last time I saw outside, it was sunny, although it was hailing before that a couple hours ago. It was quite amazing. So it's sunny. Given this graph, you would follow, OK, there's probably, first of all, there's probably more than 100 people in this room. So this is a yes. Weather is not rainy, it's a no. So I would like to hold your right hand up. OK, great job. A great audience. All right, so here comes the first tree. You ready? And you want to you, you wanna do the action as soon as you know the answer, of course. All right, three, two, one. Yes. <laughs> the 
just I'm confused and holding. Yes. All right. So the answer was whether it's sunny, yes. Time is afternoon, so you would hold your right hand. I think most of the people got it right. We have two feature, and this is depth two tree. I'm going to add two more depth in this tree and use four or five number of features. You ready? Yes. Oh, wow, what a great audience. This is pretty good. All right, let's see. The answer was it's sunny, it's afternoon, it's 18, and was there free coffee? I guess I didn't see it, but I guess there was. So clap. Great job. All right. Now, lastly, I'm going to add two more depths in this tree, keeping the number of features the same. You ready? It's the last one. You got this. <laughs> All right, lots of varying answers. Some hold hands. I don't even know if somebody is stumped. All right, let's find what the answer was. Weather, cloudy, no. 2018, yes. Uh, time morning, no. Year greater, yes. Total number of people, less than 100, no. People in first row, no. Clap. Good job, Lawrence. Got brownie points. Great job. But we saw lots of people answering differently, right? And moreover, if you get it right, can you explain what the overall logic was in this tree? Or if I give you 20 data points, do you think you can tell me what the most important feature was in, in, in the sense that it was used more often? It's difficult, right? So maybe, maybe it was the slides. The slides was a little busy, and it's a tree, so maybe we need a little more something compact. What about like rule list? Well, the challenging part of this is that in order to reach your hungry and you are going to eat, you have to remember everything above that was false. It wasn't sunny and hot, it wasn't sunny and cold, it wasn't wet at weekday, there was no free coffee, and so on. What about something even more compact? like rule sets. Maybe not. Still pretty complex. So as we discovered, it is not necessarily true that decision trees or linear classifiers are always interpretable. And this is really not to say that these methods don't work. They do work brilliantly sometimes. The point here is that there is no one-size-fits-all method that will just work no matter what end task or goal you might be aiming for. So you might also ask, well, how about, what about the models that has huge superhuman performance, like AlphaGo? In that case, maybe it's just too complex. Maybe we just can't understand what it's doing at all. So maybe interpretability is just impossible. Well, we don't need to understand every single bits and bytes of a model to claim that we have interpretability. It is about knowing enough to help your end task or to help you achieve your goal. So what is enough? Well, it depends. Depending on what you're trying to achieve, depending on what your end task is. That is for you to decide, but I can share what my goal is. My goal is to use machine learning responsibly. And this means to me that models reflect the values that I care, like fairness. And it can reflect domain experts' knowledge, like doctors' years of field experience in the model. So this is cool. We have a goal. Now we can just write down the math equations for what this means and optimize for it, right? Well, unfortunately, these things that we want to achieve is hard to write down in math because it's fundamentally underspecified problem. Let's think about something simple. What does it mean to have the best image classifier? Sure, it has to be accurate, but let's say I took this image classifier, I start a company, and I'm serving, offering a service for users. I want it to perform well, but I also want to do the right thing. I don't want to offend anybody with my image classifier. Can, you write down, can we write down every single case when someone might be offended once, and once it's passed all those tests, then you have 
the best image classifier? Well, it's a hard thing to do. It's a really high bar. Some other types of underspecified problem includes building a safe autonomous car. What does it mean to build a safe car? You've heard about trolley problem. This is hypothetical thinking experiment that people do. You're driving down a trolley down the track. You have two choices. You can either run over these four people or you can pull the lever and kill one person. What's the right thing to do? And this purely hypothetical thinking experiment indicates that it's even hard for humans to figure out what the right thing is. Say for whom, right? Science. People use machine learning for science to discover something new. Well, it's something new, so you don't know what that new thing is. Because if you do, it's not new or you're not doing science. So you can't really write down that in math either. Mismatched objectives. You have a drug, you want to fix your patient, but it turns out that patient cares about being fixed, but she or he also cares a lot about not gaining weight or not going, getting into depression. You might be using this drug to fix a patient, but you might be optimizing for a slightly different objective than what patient really wanted. And because of this characteristic, fundamental characteristic, it's not something more data or clever algorithm can help you. So you might go, well, yeah, sounds like everything is under specified problem. Are you saying we need interpretability for everything? No, we don't need interpretability. There are cases where we don't want it. For instance, if only thing you ever care is your performance and your prediction doesn't really have serious consequences, then yeah, you don't need interpretability. And some other cases where there is sufficient empirical evidence that this thing works, then it's fine. I flew here and I was happy to, I don't know how to pl fly a plane, I don't have a pilot license, but I was happy to fly here instead of taking train. I know that there's some risks of getting on a plane, but it, it's okay, I accepted that risk, I know it works most of the time. If you have systems that one might game the system, you may also not want interpretability. So you might say, okay, well, it sounds good. Now, once I identified I need interpretability for my problem, I go get it, which comes with fairness, accountability, trust, and causality, right? No. These are important topics to study, but we're not the same thing. In fact, we call them cousins. Our cousins are not us. You can have perfect fairness, pick your favorite definition of fairness, and you can optimize for it, and under that definition, you have achieved fairness. But you may not need interpretability at all in, 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 in that process. And vice versa, you can achieve perfect interpretability, but you have not, you have not built a fair system. So they are different. So, so far I talked about when and why we need interpretability and at, throughout the talk I'm going to present you with some common misunderstandings and, and, and uh, that might help you along the way. So now I'm going to talk about overview of interpretability method and I'm going to get the microphone off. Sorry. All right, cool. All right, so uh, think about building a machine learning model as like building a house. You can, there are three things you can do. You can improve interpretability before building any model. You can build a new model that has inherent interpretability in it. Or you can improve interpretability after building a model. And in fact, you can really go a long way by trying to improve interpretability before building any model. Exploring the data and really understanding your data before building any model can really help you. So it's not true that you need a model to start talking about interpretability. So let's take a deep dive on this. It's called exploratory data analysis. It's an umbrella term, term but you might be familiar with visualization, which is a type of exploratory data analysis. So. Throughout the talk, I'm going to use my toy example that I made up. We have blue class and red class. Blue is circle and red is X. 
The simplest exploratory data analysis you can do is to look at descriptive statistics. And this is a really simple thing. Write down your mean and standard deviation. But as you can see, the data has a lot more to offer than mean and standard deep can offer. So is there a better way? Yes. This is a tool that is built and open sourced by Brain. It's called Facets. And this visualization tool offers you to slice and dice your data with respect to input features of your, of, of your choice, bin those input features in the way that you want to help you gain better insights into your data. And this helps you to identify maybe skewed distributions in your data points or missing values. And I want to take this opportunity to call out for communities in human computer interaction, cognitive psychology, and uh, cognitive science and psychology folks to join in, in journey of solving interpretability. Interpretability is fundamentally about machine, but also fundamentally about humans. We really need to understand how humans parse this complex information to solve this problem. And of course, you can't talk about visualization without talking about T-SNE. So Lawrence is going to talk right after this talk more about T-SNE. There are some other exploratory data analysis that you can do. For instance, you can use examples to explain your data. You can run k-means or k-nearest neighbor to do this. But what about these little pockets of data points, these guys? They're minority, they're not outliers because they have friends around them. And these minority data points are sometimes the ones that cause weird behavior in your model. So what about these data points? Can we learn explicitly them? Uh, yes, this is some work that I did a couple of years ago. You can learn prototype, which represents the majority, what is prototypical about each class, and at the same time, you can learn minority, which we call criticisms. It's a very simple framework to do this. First, you fit a distribution P such that it will best represent your red class, the red axis. And then you look at difference between that P distribution and data distribution to explicitly collect and mine those minorities. And you can do all this by using this nice framework, MMD, maximum mean discrepancy, which I didn't develop. It's a really nice framework where you never have to write down what P and Q look like. You can just use samples to calculate this. So those are a couple of ways to improve interpretability before building any model. Next up is building a new model. Sometimes you can build a whole new model. Then the question that you ask yourself is, what is the medium or constraints we want to use to build an inherently interpretable model? Lots of options. Rules, as we looked at. Examples, sparsity, and monotonicity. So again, we come back to our toy example, blue class and red class. Rule-based, uh, can, you can learn something like, if you look at feature two, if feature two is under 0.3, then you can safely predict its red class. If that's not true, you can look at F1 instead and keep dissecting the space and learn rules that fits this classifier. Lots of good work has been done in this area, rule lists and rule sets and so on. You can also fit a simpler function per each feature so that human can only parse one feature at a time. And you're familiar with linear model. It's actually, linear model is a type of this kind, fitting linear function, fitting, fitting, fitting function per feature, for, by putting coefficient, constant coefficient for your each feature. There's something called generalized linear model. You know logistic regression. It's a type of generalized linear model. In addition to learning the coefficient, you also learn a function for your target variable, y. And this function that I've shown you is what's called generalized additive model. In addition to learning your function g, you also learn function for each of your feature, f. And you can imagine you can constrain this f to have a sparse or monotonicity or other cool constraints that you want. Another method, use examples. I can say, 
blue classes are like these pictures. These are actual training data points. Red class is like these pictures. And the, the reason that examples are powerful um, has a lot of evidence in cognitive science. They discovered that humans think in, and act in example, especially if you're uh, experts like firefighters. And the fundamental reason is that examples give you the context. And you can imagine showing you this one picture is better than I average all the input features, so average across all the dog pictures, and show you the average. So you might say, yeah, of course, it's an image. Of course, the image, you can just show me an image and it just works. Well, here's a one striking example that it's not an image, but still example-based work is, it, uh, works. Uh, this is a clustering method of we clustered Python homework submissions from an introductory Python class that was taught at MIT for over a couple of years. And when we clustered homework submissions for particular homework problem, dot product, into cluster. And we're showing three prototypes, oops, three prototypes, and when it, this is clicked, this is interact interface, then you can see other homework submissions that, are, that falls into this cluster. And we built this tool to help teachers, uh, TAs, who had to create the grading rubric and grade the whole homework. If you have a TA, then you create a grading rubric and you grade the halfway and you just constantly discovering that there's one thing that everyone got wrong and now you have to go back and grade everything again because you updated the grading rubric. So this work is to help those teachers to, before you grade anything, just get a good idea what crazy, crazy things that your students did and, and then make the grading rubric and grade them, save some time. So the teachers can interact in two different ways. You can select unselect keywords or promote an example to a prototype of the cluster. So here's a one way that teacher might use this tool. First cluster, teacher looks at, it looks like a while was an important keyword in this cluster. And a lot of students used while, and teacher doesn't find anything surprising yet until teacher finds something surprising. A student imported a library. And depending on who you're talking to, this is a great idea or a terrible idea because you're learning how to code. So teacher decided, oh my, and, and, and updated into, uh, promoted this into a prototype, indicate what's interesting, and so on. So you can see that what, while this is not image-based, the context was so important in better understanding this data. Other constraints and medium you can use, sparsity, mimic models, build some model that, that behaves like your complex model. If you can do this globally, forget about your complex model, replace it with your simple model, and you're done. You can enforce monotonicity, which means once the function is going up, it keeps going up. Once the function starts to go down, then it keeps going down. So it lessens the burden for humans having to parse this information. Lots of good work starting, done in here. I also saw a couple papers at CBPR this year that, uh, in, it, that builds an inherently interpretable model by either constrained filters and, and a lot of other cool stuff. So I just did control F on the program, interpretability, and then a couple of papers pop up. So I encourage you to check them out. Lastly, I will talk about how to improve interpretability after building a model without, the cha without changing the model. Again, we get back to our toy example, blue and red class, and we have a model some nonlinear function, maybe overfit a little bit, but we have one. Uh, first thing that you might be able to do is ablation test. What this means you, is re, you remove one or two or three features at a time, you train a model, and see how much that impacted your score, or accuracy or loss function, whatever. And that tells you how important the, this feature or set of features were. Then you can, the nat next natural question is, well, how many should I remove one at a time? Two at a time, three at a time? And you can see it quickly explodes. It's very expensive. So there are some cool, cool work to make this more efficient, like inflation functions. This one is to attribute to a particular training data point. But because oftentimes it is just expensive, people do approximation, like fit a linear function or use first-order derivative. 
And that looks like this. P of x, if that's like a logit layer probability of your class, you take the derivative with respect to this feature, f1, and that, rep that represents how important, if I change this feature a little bit, how much would my score change? And lots of work done in this area, saliency map and line work also fall into this, this field. And you can see it gives, gives us a lot of insight and it sort of looks like it works. White dog, white background, we have ID correctly identified white dog. One word of caution though, when you're using local explanation, by which I mean you're fitting a function that is locally true, you and your neighbors, you may end up getting something completely contradictory. So for instance, these two blue dots has very similar values in F1. But the explanations are completely different because they lie on different side of the curve. And to put this realistically, let's say we have a credit card application classifier, and it will come back to me and say, Bean, your credit card application was rejected because you're Asian. And it would, same classifier would go to Belay and say, Belay, your application is accepted because you're Asian. And once you start having this contradictory, it's very easy to lose the trust from users and it's very hard to regain that trust. I would also like to share our recent work that was uh, super interesting, is that some saliency maps look similar when we randomize the network. So what we did here it was a simple experiment. We took a network and we randomized the weights. So I took perfectly good network and now network is predicting garbage. I ran saliency map and it turns out that some of the saliency maps are visually similar before and after randomizing the weights. Now this is not to say these saliency maps don't work. It's just saying that we, are, we, are, we actually don't really understand what these methods are giving to us, this local approximation method, and we gotta understand and communicate that expectation well to the users or, or consumers of these explanations. So just because you have explanation doesn't mean that is how the model works. And you again have to communicate that well with the users, especially if the user is a lay person who doesn't really know machine learning. So another interesting set of work, which I'm not going to talk in detail because we have a great speakers after me who will talk more detail about this. Uh, Andrea is going to talk about reconstructing the images from activations. First deep dream paper which showed, which discovered this neuron that looks like arms when predicting dumbbell class, where they had made, their, where they made qualitative discovery that, oh, maybe arms matter in predicting dumbbell. Some new work that uses generative model to generate explanations using attributions and activation layer. And network dissection paper gave us this really good insight, which says, well, networks learn concepts even if it wasn't explicitly coded in the loss function. This is Bollet's work. And this is, speaking of concepts, that is really interesting. Can we, you, can we measure the sensitivity of a concept for a model? So for instance, if I have a zebra class, can I measure concept stripedness? Well, you might say, yeah, sure. I mean, if, we, if you know how to represent what the, how the, the represent the concept, then sure. Well, we did the simplest possible thing and it worked and I think we can get a lot more sophisticated than this, but I'll share this result with you. There has been lots of results, starting from first work to vec paper, that there is this vector in activation layer that represents gender or race. So we simply train the linear classifier that separates activations of a stripe pictures from random pictures. And we took the vector orthogonal to that linear classifier. And that vector simply points from random pictures to striped pictures. And we simply use that vector to take directional derivative. And what that says is, if I move my picture a little bit onto this vector direction, how much would my zebraness change? If it changes a lot, stripedness is important. If it's not, then it's not important. And using this concept-based sensitivity test is helpful because now then you can quantify your discoveries. 
And here are some confirmations that we made what was previously qualitative discovery, like ping pong ball with Asians, because we were good at playing ping pong. And the picture that you saw, dumbbell and arms, we show, yeah, arms were important in predicting dumbbell class. Also, because these high-level concepts are intuitive to lay person, we can actually use their language to generate explanations. And it's useful for domains like medicine. We use TCAV to reveal that model sometimes uses diagnostic concepts that doctors wouldn't have looked for. And this is revealing for the doctors, maybe perhaps uh, help them to decide when to use this model and maybe when they shouldn't. So we looked at three different types of interpretability method. Last but not least, I'm going to briefly talk about how to evaluate interpretability methods. Do human experiments. The sole reason for existence of interpretability method is for human consumption. So show us that it works for humans. And I recommend doing a measurable, giving them a measurable task. What do I mean? Give them a task to do, the humans, uh, such as prediction task, which means I give them explanation. I ask them, what would model do? I know what model did, so I have a ground truth. And I can estimate how well humans did. I can also estimate how quickly they did it. Or validation task. Give the explanation, give what machine learning model did, change it a little bit, and ask human, was this right, given what you know about the model? Did the model did the right thing? And by giving these tasks, you can quantitatively measure the performance. In some cases, you may not need human experiments. Uh, you might say, well, maybe I don't have resources, or maybe I have to graduate. There are some cases you don't need it. And I refer to this write-up for, for, for more information. Formulate an experiment where you have ground truth. What do I mean? Let me give you an example. Here's an example of ground truth experiment setup. This is a completely made up experiment just to show you that this method works. What am I doing? We have an image. We have picked three classes. And we wrote caption in English on the left bottom corner. Now we chain, we created four training data sets with varying degree of noise. 0% noisy means that whenever there was a cap picture, there was a letter cap. 100% noisy means the image had nothing to do with the caption. Where am I going with this? Well, why are we doing this? Well, because now we have a control over which each concept in this picture. And the goal of TCAV was estimate the concept importance. And where is the ground truth coming from? Well, we can test each model trained on these four different training data sets and give it this image without a caption. If the model does well, that means model used the image. Because I didn't give you a caption. If you, if you would have used caption, you would show low accuracy, like this guy did. 0% noisy, whenever, caption, whenever there was a cap picture, the caption cap appeared. So maybe model looked at the caption and ignored the image. So here, you have a ground truth. And this is the ground truth for importance of image concept. And then you show how well your method works. So for a case of cap class, we show that TCAP score closely followed the ground truth, the accuracy, the blue line. And interestingly, for CAB, it always looked at the image. It never looked at the caption. For Cucumber case, Cucumber class, the story was a little different. It actually looked at the caption when we gave a perfect 0% noisy caption. And we think that has to do with maybe the length of the caption. And you can see the accuracy closely follows. So this looks high, but there are three classes, so 0.33 is random. So it's, it's pretty low. It's close to random. Then now you might ask, well, sh sh cool. Well, how do you then compare with your benchmark? Well, here's a benchmark, the saliency map. And you might ask, maybe saliency maps can do the same thing. Here, this model for CAB always looked at the image. The ground truth is the image concept. When we gave it CAB picture with a CAB uh, caption, it seems to highlight a little bit of the letter. 
So then you should ask, well, maybe this is a cherry-picked example. Maybe. So then you go and run Turker experiment. We ask 50 Turkers to tell us all three classes, two different saliency maps. What do you think which concept was more important for this model? We saw that most of the time, Turkers couldn't agree. They were split in half. I'm image, I'm caption. And when they did agree, they agreed on the wrong thing. They said, ah, caption, but no, it was looking at the image. And by doing this experiment, we discovered something really interesting. That humans are so confident when they're wrong. And this might tell us something about, you know, traditional classical psychology, confirmation bias. When you believe in X, you only see evidence for X. And that might be the case. 50, 40% of peop people rated as confident as they can in questions that they were wrong. And this is to say, again, to reiterate our earlier point, that we really need to understand how humans process information, what are the patterns that we have in our cognitive ability, what are the limitations of our cognition ability, to really solve the interpretability problem. So to wrap up, do human experiments, formulate an experiment with ground truth when you can. So I would like to conclude um, I went over when and why you need interpretability, and maybe sometimes when you don't need interpretability, how you do it before building model, when you're building a new model, after building a, new mo uh, building a model, and how to evaluate human experiment and ground truth experiment. Last but not least, I just helped write up uh, Google's best practices of interpretability. It was published along with AI principles that we put out. And this is written for practitioners, and I hope that's helpful for some people. With that, I would like to leave it to the next speaker, or do we have to take questions? Question. Okay. Lay says a question. Questions? They're not ready for the questions. Oh, so Blake's question was, how can you use results from interpretability method to improve models? Is that right? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's like the holy grail of a um, uh, uh, good way to show, convince your friend who, if, who, who, who is not convinced of our interpretability method that, oh, I can improve your model. This has been done many times. If you remember, I believe, um, backprop or... I think it was a Ziller's paper that showed that they identified, no, maybe deconvolution, right? Deconvolutional paper where they identified the dead neuron in their network. They changed the architecture and they ended up improving the, the overall, overall accuracy. There's also work that's done by our team at Brain. I wasn't part of it. They built a visualization and used actually TSNE to map a language translation model and they discover an issue with the model which then they went and fixed it. This is all public, public, published results. So yeah, good question. I think we should work more on that. Yes, question. Hi. Um, if locally a feature importance is zero, globally it can be important. So all the, are these local explanation methods useful? So the thing is, a feature can be locally less important and have a score of zero, whereas globally it can have a high importance. Yes, yes. It's a good question. Local explanation versus global explanation. So local explanation, just, just to recap, is explanation about one data point. And to answer your question, depends on what you want. So for legal cases, for instance, you might really have to dig deeper into one data point because judges ask for it and you have to dig uh, as deep as you can, in which case fitting the local explanation is the right way to go. If your goal is to explain the model globally and give an idea of how the model generally operates, then global explanation is way to go. Because if a feature always saturates, then the gradient will be always zero locally. But whereas globally, a nonlinear model could have learned it. So uh, in these cases, is there any way to check whether the whether a feature is saturating feature is important or not? 
That's a great question. Uh, there's some work done at Brain uh, lately. It's called Integrated Gradient. I think I mentioned in one of my slides. They address this problem of uh, saturated gradients. And I, I recommend to that. They have uh, really nice axioms to define what to do with these saturation features, saturated features. Probably too long to go into right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a few cases where actually we do not, do not want interpretability. And one of them is uh, maybe people are trying to game the system. Um, you know, I can imagine a lot of people are trying to game Google's system, right? Uh, their search engine optimization and things like that. Uh, could you maybe share a little more about um, if, if that's a uh, consideration or uh, if you deal with that uh, in any way uh, in terms of interp interpretability? Uh, oh. if, if that's something you can talk about. If that interpretability here is okay. Oh, you mean like at Google in particular? Or, or, you know, just, just as a kind of a practical guidelines? I think there are surprisingly lots of uh, cases where that's, the, that's true. So, for instance, uh, a, a, f a popular example of that is FICO. Um, you get rejected from credit card and you call up the customer service and they will tell you what, why you got rejected. But Here's actually a good point that I want to make is if, you're, if you don't have mismatched objectives and human can game the system by which they mean they would improve their spending habit, then it's actually ultimately for good. If you don't have mismatched objective, then you're fine them gaming your system. But because it's hard to get that balance all the time and you, don't, you may not know a priori that you don't have, you, you have mismatched objectives, then it becomes really tricky. So there's one example there. Yes, uh, let me know if I'm yeah, I... Um, well, this is a little bit mixed between technical and philosophical in a way. Uh, will you say that if we have a weak understanding of... Or if we're trying to use the, the model to gain some knowledge that we don't have, or maybe if, if we... Or, inter in, uh, or the rules we apply are weak, can the model itself start throwing away whatever precautions we take there for what you're suggesting we should be applying from the beginning. So ca can the model itself it end up saying, okay, well, what you were assuming that was the ethical or proper way to do it, I decided that's off the record. I'm not sure if Inter I get to... So basically the interoperability thing, no, sorry, the, um, you, you're suggesting we should provide certain rules for it. You, we should provide some constraints from to the model, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, and then can the model itself determine, okay, since you were so weak in the way you define them, I just throw them away and... Oh, is your question that better structure will help the models yeah. in performance? Absolutely. And Occam's razor, right? Uh, if you don't have much data, put more structure in it, build a simple yeah. model, and you will better off. So there's a lot of evidence that simple model works better. That's your question. Okay. Should I? Thank you. Yeah, let's thank Spin. So our next speaker is Lawrence van der Matten. So Lawrence is currently a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Before that, he worked as a system professor at Daft University of Technology. You may not know who is Lawrence, but you may have been using Tasni to visualize your data. So Lawrence invented Tasni about 10 years ago. So today, Lawrence will uh, bring some tips on how to use Tasni from the perspective of Tasni's creator. Yeah, let's thanks uh, Lawrence. Thank you, uh, thank you, Belay. Thanks for the kind introduction. It's kind of exceptional that you know you you get invited to give a tutorial about work that's like ten years old. Uh, but it's really cool to be here. Uh, also, thanks to Bean for giving a nice uh, introduction to I guess all of the other talks. I think where sort of this talk is located is mostly in what she called exploratory uh, data analysis. Although I do think that you can also use TSNE for sort of the third uh, part that she was describing, namely to um, investigate, explore some of the characteristics that your trained models uh, have. And I, I hope to be giving some examples of that. Um, so I called this, um, the, this, uh, this talk, Do's and Don'ts of Using TSNE, uh, because I wanted to seize the opportunity to, you know, on the one hand, sort of explain what the algorithm is doing, uh, but also to sort of cover some of the caveats or some of the things to be careful about when you're using this algorithm to, to visualize your, uh, your data. 
Um, so on a high level, like the goal of this tutorial uh, is three, th three things. I want to tell you about like how TSNE works. Uh, I want to tell you about you know, what kind of visualizations can you create using these techniques. Um, but then probably the most important thing is, you know, I want to tell you about like what should I be careful about and, and you know, what should I not do um, in terms of sort of assigning meaning to the kinds of, uh, to the visualizations that, these, that this method is, uh, is producing. Um, a lot of these things are actually not specific to TSNE, but sort of to a much larger family of, you know, manifold learners and classical scaling, et, et cetera. Okay, so that being said, so let's start with uh, just sort of a short introduction to, uh, to this algorithm. Um, so what is, the, what is the learning setting? What's the setting that we're in? So the setting I'll assume is that we're given a set of high dimensional data points. Uh, I'll call them X1 to X capital N. Um, and these can be anything, right? Like this, this is your, you know, this can be images or audio or, or whatever. And basically, you know, sort of at the start of your research process, uh, if you're a data scientist or a machine learning practitioner, um, the question that you often have is like, you know, what does this data look like, right? Like what is my, uh, what is my data? Um, and so that's kind of the question that we're, that we're trying to answer. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by trying to build a map uh, of the data in a two or three dimensional space. Um, and so there exists a ton of techniques to, uh, to do this and probably the most classical one would be uh, uh, principal component analysis, PCA, right? Um, so I'm showing an example here of a PCA map of the MNIST digits. Um, as I said, this work is 10 years old, so, you know, so are the data sets. Um, and what you see here is a, a two-dimensional projection of this MNIST data set. So each point here corresponds to a digit image, and the color of the point corresponds to the digit that is represented in the image. Um, and I forgot to put the legend here, but the, the red points on the left, they are the zeros. And the orange points on the right, they're the ones. Um, and this horizontal direction is the first principal component, right? And that may sound weird at first because, you know, zeros and ones are, are quite close. But if you think about them in terms of pixel values, which is what I'm doing here, these are actually the two digits that are least uh, overlapping in terms of pixel values, right? And so they're the source of sort of maximum variation, uh, which is what, uh, what sort of this first principal component is capturing. If you look at the second principal component, so this is the vertical direction, on the top you'd see four sevens and nines, and on the bottom you'd see threes, fives, and eights. Um, so these are you know, somewhat similar in terms of pixel values. Now this plot looks pretty nice, right? Like there's, you know, there's definitely some structure here. Um, but of course you only see that structure because I gave you the colors, right? If I remove the colors, you really wouldn't have much of a clue what's, what's going on here, right, of, of what this data set looks like. Um, so why is that? Like, why is sort of PCA not, not really sort of the, you know, the right method for uh, this kind of mapping? Well, so, so one problem of PCA is that it's learning a linear mapping, right, which is pretty restrictive. Um, it, it sort of limits what, um, you know, what, what can be represented in the, uh, in the map. And then the second thing is that if you think about uh, PCA, what it's doing is it's basically minimizing sort of a sum of squared errors objective, right? Like a sum of squared errors, I guess, between like the distances between points in the original space and the distance between points in the, uh, in the map, right? Between the corresponding points. And so what that will do is uh, like any sort of squared objective, it will focus on the large uh, numbers, right? It will focus on the large distances. So PCA is really concerned about making sure that, you know, the zeros get exactly the right distance from the ones, right? And if it makes a mistake in that, it gets penalized a lot in terms of the loss that it's, that it's minimizing. Um, but for, for a long time, people have realized that these, these sort of long, these, these large distances are not really the distances that are, you know, very trustworthy or very informative. Um, and, and sort of an example that uh, people used in the literature 10, 15 years ago for this is this Swiss roll where, you know, the, the distance between sort of these two relatively far away points um, is not, the, in, in, in terms of Euclidean distance, is not really very representative of sort of the true uh, distance between those points if you were to sort of follow the data manifolds. 
Um, and so, so the idea, or what this is suggesting, is that the only distances um, in the original sort of data space that, um, that you can really trust are sort of these small distances, is sort of the local structure of the, uh, um, of the data. Um, and that's probably also the structure that you care about most in, uh, in visualizations. You don't really care much about like, you know, how different zeros are exactly from ones, right? All you need to know is that zeros are different from ones, right? Um, and you can use sort of that, you know, what you gain by that to get a more accurate representation of what zeros are or what ones are. Um, so that was sort of the, the motivation for uh, for TSNI and a lot of uh, sort of related techniques um, in, in, in manifold learning. Um, and they were all based around this idea of uh, trying to capture local structure of the data. Um, so here's how that, uh, how that works in practice in the, in the case of TSNI. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our high dimensional data and uh, we're going to, so xi here is a high dimensional data point, it's the red block, and xj is some other point. And what we're going to do is, um, we're, excuse me, we're going to um, center a Gaussian kernel uh, on top of data point xi, and we're going to measure the density of uh, data point xj under that, under that Gaussian, right? Uh, so that's the top part of this fraction here. Um, and now what we're going to do, so, you know, we do this for all pairs of points, for all uh, n squared pairs of points, and we normalize the result. So that's the bottom part of the diffraction, right? So it's really, you know, computing a Gaussian kernel and then normalizing the thing. And this gives us a kind of uh, distribution over pairs of points where the probability of picking a pair of points is proportional to their similarity. Right, and their similarity in this case, so that's, that's what is called the PIJ here um, um, in, the, uh, in the equation. Um, and the similarity in this case is, um, is really measuring a kind of local structure, right? If two points are close together, then this <coughs> two points I and J are close together, then this PIJ value will be relatively large. And if they're not close together, the PIJ value will be infinitesimal, right? Irrespective of uh, of how far they are apart. Um, so now that we've captured some, you know, uh, the local structure of the high dimensional data, what we're going to do is we're going to define a similar uh, distribution in, um, uh, in the low dimensional map. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by um, basically again taking a, um, uh, taking a, a circular kernel centering it on top of yi and measuring the density of yj under that kernel. Um, and I realized that I put the wrong equation here uh, because I wrote a, a Gaussian kernel, but of course it should be a, uh, a student t kernel. Um, what this is going to give us is uh, a second uh, distribution that measures the local similarity of points in the two-dimensional map. Right? If two points are close together in uh, the low-dimensional map, then this QIJ value will be large, and otherwise it's, it will be infinitesimal. So now that we've characterized this uh, distribution, what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the, uh, a kind of divergence, a, a kind of discrepancy measure between these two uh, distributions. Right? So between this high-dimensional distribution uh, P and the low dimensional distribution uh, Q. Um, and the way we measure it is by um, measuring the kubek leibler divergence between these two distributions. Um, and so what we're going to do is really just um, minimize this kubek leibler divergence with respect to the locations of the points in the low dimensional map. Right? You have to keep in mind that the QIJ here in the, in the expression is a function of the location of points in the map. Right? And that's what the, the minimization is going to be over. And then hopefully if we do that well, we end up with a configuration that, that accurately reflects at least the local structure um, of the high dimensional data. So why do we use this kubek leibler divergence? Um, well, the basic idea is that this, this kubek leibler divergence, I mean, apart from uh, uh, sort of, you know, being, being well, theoretically well motivated, is that it, it really focuses on preserving local data structure. Um, and the reason is doing, uh, you, you can see that sort of from the, uh, from the plot here. 
um, it, or f from the, uh, the, the expression here, if I have two uh, similar high dimensional data points, right, what that means is that they have a large value PIJ. So if I have a large value PIJ there to the left of the lock and a large value PIJ to the right of the lock, I better make sure that my QIJ is also going to be large, right? Because otherwise I'm dividing a large value by a small value, this will blow up, and on the other side of the lock, I'll multiply it by a large value, so it'll continue to be large. Um, so if I have a big P value, uh, but a small Q value, I suffer, I suffer a large loss, right? It doesn't quite work the other way around. If I have two dissimilar points, right, this means that the p-value is going to be, you know, very small, infinitesimal. If I, if I assign, um, um, if I, you know, model these by two points uh, being close together, uh, so a large q-value, then I'm actually not suffering a very big loss, right, because the, the expression, the fraction, or the log fraction, gets multiplied by a small pig, uh, PIJ value on the left. Um, you do have to keep in mind though that by uh, spending um, by spending sort of a large Q value to model a small P value, I am losing something. Namely, I'm using a, I'm losing a little bit of probability mass, right? The Q is a distribution. There was some kind of normalization in it, and so if I if I sort of use my, sort of the probability mass that I have in QIJ, if I use that in an ineffective way, you know, I'm going to pay a price somewhere else, right? There's going to be some local structure that I'm not going to be able to, to model well. Um, so then the second question is, you know, so one is, you know, why this callback library divergence? The second question is, why do we use a, a heavy tail distribution to measure similarities in the low dimensional space? Uh, so again, my, my slide there was, was incorrect. It listed a, a Gaussian uh, kernel to measure similarities on the Ys, but we're really doing it using a heavy tailed shoot and T kernel. So why are we doing this? Like, why is that a good thing? Um, so sort of the motivation for this is as follows. If I have um, high dimensional data, so let's say I have, you know, points that are sampled uniformly from a 10 dimensional hypercube, and I'm going to try and map this data down into two dimensions in such a way as to preserve the local structure of that data, then what this means is that sort of dissimilar data points have to be modeled too far apart in the map. There's no other way. Um, and th this may be a little bit uh, complicated to, to realize, so I have a very simple example of this here uh, on the slides. So let's say we have three points living in a two-dimensional space, and we're going to try and map down these three points to uh, two dimensions, uh, sorry, to one dimension. And let's say, you know, these red rods, let's call, let's call that the local structure, those are the small distances, right, they're a distance of one. and you know, the, 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 the connection where there's no rods, that is sort of the, the large distance, right? It's a, it's a distance of square root two. And we're going to project this data down to one dimension uh, while preserving the local structure, right? So while keeping the rods at the same length. Well, we can perfectly do this, right? This would be the solution. But look what happened, right? These, these two dissimilar points, they went from having a distance of square root two uh, to having a distance of two. Right? And so what this is sort of illustrating is that whenever you map down high dimensional data into a very low dimensional space and you preserve local structure, then, you know, for large distances, they need to be modeled uh, too far apart. Um, and what this student T kernel, this heavy tailed kernel is essentially doing is it's saying it's okay to do that. Uh, you, you're not going to be suffering a loss for sort of incorrectly modeling this large distance. So why, it's, why is it doing that? Well, the idea is as follows, right? Let's say I have two points that have, uh, in the original data, they have a distance of, let's say, 10 apart, right? And under the Gaussian kernel, this gives me uh, a density of, let's say, 0.1, right? Then in the low dimensional space, to get the same density of point one, these points need to have a distance of say 30 apart, right? And so the, the use of this heavy tail distribution is really allowing you uh, to model, uh, you know, dissimilar data as being too far apart. Okay, so what does that look like in practice? So here's a, here's a visualization of, um, 
you know, running gradient descent in this Kubrick Leibler divergence on that same MNIST data set. Um, what you see is that the, um, that sort of the, the map starts off really small. That's how we initialize it. This is actually really important. If you would initialize the data to be very large, you'd end up in horrible uh, local minima. Um, the the Kubek library divergence that we're minimizing here is, is a very non convex function. And so the way you optimize it really does matter in, uh, in practice. And what you end up with is a, is a, is a map that looks something like this. Um, where, you know, what you'll see is that um, there's a lot more sort of of that local structure that is, that is being preserved. Um, in particular, you can see that when you sort of plot back the original digits, um, and when you like zoom in, let's say, on the cluster of zeros here, what you see is that, you know, there's local structure in these zeros uh, where they sort of go from round zeros to more elongated ones on the right. And when there's a little bit of sort of rotation structure in these zeros. All of this is based on uh, pixel values, by the way. There's no computer vision here uh, whatsoever. Um, and also, all of this is unsupervised, right? So the method doesn't know about sort of the classes. The only way I use the classes is to label the, the scatter or to color the scatter plots later on. Um, so here's a, here's a second example, right? So here's that same sort of cluster of four sevens and nines. Um, these, these clusters or these, you know, these digits are somewhat similar in terms of pixel values. And what you see is that sort of in between the, the natural clusters, there are a few digits that are, you know, that are hard to identify, right? It's hard to see whether they're fours or nines. Um, and that's basically what's tying these clusters together in this, um, in this visualization. I want to make one sort of last remark on the efficiency of this thing. Um, so, I, as I explained to you, we're computing basically Gaussian and student t kernels over all pairs of points. And so, a naive implementation is, is quadratic in the number of data points, right? Which is not great if you're, if you're dealing with large data sets uh, in the way that we're doing today. Um, but as it turns out, you can sort of do very effective approximations that make this uh, order n log n or even order n. Um, and all these approximations are based on sort of a similar idea, which is that if you look at the gradient of uh, this function that we're, uh, that we're minimizing of this Kubeck library divergence, uh, what you'll see is that it's basically measuring point interactions. And as it turns out, you can sort of, when these point interactions are between, you know, a group of points, the A, B, and C here, um, to like one other point, uh, point I in this case, that is relatively far away. This is far away in the, uh, the current sort of version of the map. Then you can approximate those interactions by basically taking the center of, ma center of mass of A, B, and C, computing the interaction and multiplying it by three. Um, so this is basically what uh, the barnes hut uh, approximation is doing. And there are more formal versions of this that are, that are based on something called fast multiple methods that can speed this up uh, even more at the, at the expense of having a higher constant. Um, so it is possible to do this relatively efficiently even on large data sets. Cool. So the next thing uh, I want to talk about is, you know, what are some of the do's, right? Like what are, what are, what are some of the ways in which you can use these methods to, uh, to sort of visualize your data or to explore your models? Um, and I'll start by an example of some stuff I was working on in my PhD thesis uh, where I was working on um, uh, a fine invariant uh, feature representations for texture images. Um, this is a long time ago. Back then, people were still excited about this. Or maybe there are still some people excited. I don't know. Um, and so one of the questions that you have here is after you sort of build or created or learned a feature representation, does it really have the properties that I like, right? And the properties that I liked in this case uh, were, you know, these properties of affine invariance, right? And setting up a classification experiment, like sort of a basic one, uh, discriminating between uh, different texture classes, that is not quite giving you that answer. Um, and so TSNE may give you like some additional insights into that, right? Um, so I did a, a TSNE map of sort of these feature representations. And then what you see are clusters like this where, you know, they're suggesting that the feature representation that I've constructed is indeed quite invariant uh, to uh, locally affine transformations or, um, yeah. 
Um, so that's sort of one way in which you can do this. And so in, the, in this case, you're not on the exploratory data analysis side of, uh, of Beanstalk, but you're on the, you know, trying to understand what my model is doing uh, side, and in particular, trying to generate hypotheses about like what my model is good at and what my model is bad at. Um, TSNE is used a lot in sort of biomedical applications, and what you see there is that it's often uh, very good at like capturing uh, what are called different day biases, right? You sort of measure patients uh, on two different days with the same machine, and you know somehow something somewhere changed. And typically that will show up as like, you know, two completely different clusters and it's kind of nice to, uh, nice to know. Um, so a, a second thing I'd like to say is like, you know, be creative in what inputs you use into, uh, into this algorithm. So I explained the algorithm now as sort of starting from high dimensional data points. Uh, but in many situations, there, there are other types of, of inputs that you want to use. In particular, things like trees or networks or graphs or co-occurrences or associations. All these things quite naturally take the form of probabilities over, you know, pairs of things, right? Probabilities P, I, J. And so you can, you know, typically it's, it's fairly easy to take these kinds of data inputs, convert them to a distribution, uh, a distribution P, and then model that directly uh, uh, using TSNE, right? So you don't really need to sort of start from uh, high dimensional data in order to use this technique. Um, the third do that I wanna mention is, you know, try and be creative in, in how you visualize the outputs, right? Uh, there's a lot more to building good visualizations than just running, you know, uh, an analysis algorithm like this. Um, so to give you an example of that, uh, here's, here are the results of a study we did where uh, we took data, uh, which is basically gene expressions uh, in a mouse brain, right? So we have sort of a full 3D uh, voxel space of a mouse brain, and at each voxel, the, the data that we have are basically expressions of like 20,000 different genes. Um, and what we did is, you know, we, we uh, uh, we sort of, we use these 20,000 dimensional vectors. We threw them into TSNE. So each point here corresponds to a single voxel. Um, and in this case, the voxels are colored by the anatomical brain regions, right? And so what this plot is suggesting is that there's some relation between sort of the gene expression profile in a particular voxel and the anatomical brain region, right? Or like the function that that brain region has. Um, I deliberately say suggesting uh, because, you know, I, I don't want sort of people to draw conclusions from these kinds of plots, right? Because these plots are not the real data, they're a representation of the real data. And so I would very much think about these things as, you know, generating as a tool to generate hypotheses that you can then sort of go out and, and test. Um, but I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, this, this scatter plot looks nice, but you can sort of, you know, you can turn things around. So what you can do is you can say, well, I know that I'm in this spatially organized thing, namely being a, uh, a mouse brain. So what I can do is I can take the two or three D uh, T SNE coordinates, and I can encode them using, a, I can sort of convert those into a color, right? So now the location of a point in a scatter plot is going to be. Uh, a particular color, right? It's going to be like an RGB value. And now I can take this RGB value and I can plug it into sort of the correct location. And that will give me brain maps that look like this, right? So what this maps mean is um, basically like if two pixels have uh, the same color or a similar color, that means they have, you know, similar gene expression profiles, right? So it's exactly the same underlying plot, but it's a very different visualization. It's telling a very different story. Right, so this is what I mean uh, when I say, you know, try and be creative in, in how you use these, uh, these visualizations. Um, a second example is this map of uh, movies. This was, this was made based on the data from the Netflix uh, challenge a couple of years ago where, you know, you have sort of user movie ratings. You can learn feature representations for movies from this by doing uh, you know, something like weighted SVD, right? Like some kind of collaborative filtering. And now you can visualize these, these features. 
Um, and what we, what we found is that the sort of the most useful way to look at this is to, you know, take these features, uh, construct the corresponding 3D T-SNE map, and now, you know, plot it in this way. So two of the T-SNE coordinates correspond to the location here, and the third one is, um, is represented by a color, right? So two movies are similar uh, whenever they are close together in the plot uh, and have the same color. Um, and this is kind of a nice way to, to look at these things. Um, so if you look at some of the clusters, so for instance, these are, you know, South Park and Family Guy and so on. Um, if you look all the way at the bottom, what you'll see is, you know, all the James Bond movies. Um, but the colors are also suggesting something, right? So for instance, in the middle, there's this orange cluster, which is Indiana Jones and Final Fantasy and Raiders of the Lost Ark, etc. cetera. Um, there's this red cluster, which is all 10 seasons of Friends. Um, and there's Star Trek, which is like, you know, clearly separate from everything else. Um, and so, you know, this is another example of, you know, how you can be a bit more creative about, you know, the visualizations that you build on, on top of this analysis uh, technique. Um, for the final part of this tutorial, I want to say a little bit about the don'ts of using TSNE. Um, and I already touched upon one. Um, so what I, you know, what I see a lot when I sort of walk around uh, uh, conference halls like this is what I call proof by TSNE. Um, and, you know, I'm really not a huge fan of it, although I do appreciate the citation. Um, because, you know, uh, so this is actually a picture I made at, you know, one of the posters today. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to, you know, call out the, the authors in, in any way. I mean, this is, this is really happening a lot. Um, so, so it's being used as sort of, oh, you know, look, my method is better than this other method. Right? And really, when I look at them, I'm like, well, you know, I just see a bunch of point clouds that are a representation of some data that I don't understand, plus there are like marginal differences between them. So I'm really not quite sure what to, uh, to conclude from this. Right? And I think in particular, what is, what is dangerous is that people sometimes um, sort of assign explanations to these kinds of plots, forgetting to consider alternative hypotheses, right? Like alternative explanations. And this sort of corresponds to what Bean talked about, uh, the, these confirmation biases that, you know, we all suffer from, uh, including me. Um, so an example of that, this is from a recent uh, uh, NIPS paper, where basically the uh, the, the summary uh, of the plot is that the visualization shows that our method learns meaningful transformations, where the transformations are basically from the, uh, the purple points to the red points uh, for like different classes. And um, so the purple is basically the base state and the, the red is the sort of transformed uh, base state. So the thing that this particular method learned. Now my problem with that is this, if I uh, you know, take sort of the, the purple points and I just repeatedly multiply them by a constant that's slightly larger than one, right? So I sort of progressively scale up my data and I keep all the data around and I run TSNE on that, I get exactly the same results, right? And so there is sort of an alternative hypothesis that could explain, you know, exactly this map structure uh, that is very different from sort of the conclusion being drawn. Um, and so I think, you know, sort of the way to, to think about this or, or to, uh, to work with uh, a method like this is to only use it as a way to generate hypotheses, right? You can generate a hypothesis that, you know, uh, maybe the method is learning something meaningful, but you will have to go out and, you know, test it, right? You will have to go out and do the actual science. Um, and in this case, it's actually not so problematic, but there's a lot of papers in, in sort of biomedical uh, fields where, you know, the conclusions are of the type, you know, medicine A works better against cancer than medicine B, and then I get a little bit scared. Um, so the second don't uh, I want to mention is when you look at these plots, uh, don't assign meaning uh, to distances across empty space. Um, so basically the you know, the, I, when you look at these plots, what you have to keep in mind is that beyond sort of the scale, right, the size of the mode of the student T distribution, uh, all similarities are pretty much infinitesimal, right? All similarities are pretty much the same. So I showed you this plot earlier of the MNIST digits, and there's actually something interesting in them, right? The red points here are the zeros, and the orange points are the ones. And what you see is that they're actually quite close together. 
right? It's very different from the PCA plots. Um, and, you know, the, the reason is that, you know, basically TSNE doesn't care, right? Because, you know, there's a bunch of empty space between them uh, that is larger than sort of the scale of the, the student T distribution in this map. And so, you know, as far as sort of the, the model that, I, that is used to measure similarity in a map is concerned, these things are very dissimilar. Right? And sort of moving the, the ones farther away from the zeros really doesn't gain much in turn, you know, really doesn't buy you much in terms of the loss. And so it's not, it's not happening, right? And so you really should not sort of conclude from this that, you know, zeros are somewhat similar to ones. Um, and that's actually kind of tricky, right? Because, you know, the human visual system really tends to sort of latch onto uh, to things like this. So you have to be very conscious about this. Um, the other thing that's, that's important to keep in mind um, is that TSNE will not help you find outliers and you, uh, you can also not assign any meaning to point densities in the clusters, right? So sort of the local density of points in these, in these maps is pretty much meaningless uh, because it's there by construction. And this has to do with uh, the exact way that we uh, compute the input similarities. Um, so what I said until now was that we, you know, we just centered a Gaussian kernel with a single, uh, a single bandwidth over the high dimensional data to measure similarities. In practice, we do it slightly more involved. So here's how the input similarities in TSNE are actually computed. Uh, it's a two-step process. In the first step, we, uh, ac we compute something called conditional similarities. Um, so rather than, you know, directly constructing a joint distribution over pairs of points, PIJ, we're actually constructing conditional distributions for each point I, right? So we're constructing probabilities over, you know, all points J given point I, right? Um, so the only thing that's changing is basically here the, uh, the bottom part of this fraction, right? Where we don't normalize over the entire Gaussian kernel, but we normalize over only one row of it, right? And the reason we do this is that it allows us to set a data specific uh, bandwidth, right? So the, uh, the bandwidth here, sigma, um, it now has a, a subscript i, right? So sigma uh, is going to be specific to, um, um, to data point xi. And the way we set this sigma i is by performing a binary search over it in order to obtain a target perplexity. Uh, so the perplexity is sort of the main hyperparameter that you set when you run this, this algorithm. Um, and basically what it's, what it's determining is sort of what is the scale, like what is the number of similar, uh, the number of similar points that I'm considering. Uh, so what is, you can almost think of it as sort of the number of nearest neighbors in a nearest neighbor graph. Um, that's what it's setting. And the reason we do this is essentially to normalize out density differences, right? So if you think about the MNIST data, the cluster of ones is going to be much denser, um, right? The, the ones are going to sort of have much less variation than let's say the cluster of threes, right? And so if you wouldn't do anything like that, basically what you would see is you would see like a massive cluster of threes and then like a tiny, tiny cluster of ones. And so it doesn't look very nice, right? Um, but, you know, it is important to keep that in mind, right? That, you know, what this is essentially doing is it's sort of normalizing out, locally normalizing the density of the, of the points, right? In a very dense region, the Gaussians will be much smaller than in a very sparse uh, region of the data, right? And so when you look at the map, you can really not assign any, uh, any meaning to these densities. Um, so how do we get from these conditional uh, probabilities to uh, the joint probabilities PIJ? Uh, well, we do this complete hack, which is we symmetrize them, um, which, you know, I'm sure is, you know, wrong. Uh, but, you know, there are more hacks in, in, in TSNE that were mainly there to, you know, piss off Bayesians uh, because Jeff thought that was fun at the time. Um, so the reason we do this, or the effect that this has, is it'll basically pull in, um, it will pull in outliers. So if I have an outlying point J, 
right? Like here's my data, and here's like that one data point that is super far away. Then what will happen after this uh, symmetrization is, well, none of these points, you know, pick the outlier as their friends, right? But the outlier is going to pick some of these points as their friends, right? So like the, uh, you know, one of the two conditionals is actually going to have probability mass. Right? And because we average, essentially what's happening is this outlier is being pulled in uh, sort of into the rest of the data. Right? And so it's explicitly designed to sort of remove outliers. Right? The reason we did this is because uh, otherwise in, in something like MNIST, what you would see is basically you know, all your data here and then you know, everything would be empty and here would be your outlier. Right? Which is just not, you know, it's not very nice. But it's something to be aware of, right? We're, you know, we're effectively, you know, we're explicitly doing something to pull in outliers, right? And so what TSNE is really not is a way to identify um, outliers, right? It's, it's, it's a way to hide them, to remove them. Um, so this, this perplexity thing already came up. Um, so this perplexity is basically setting the scale. Right, it's setting sort of you know what is uh, what is considered local structure or similar data in the data space, and what is considered uh, you know non-local or, or dissimilar data. Um, and the way you set it is actually you know it's quite important. Um, so here's an example that I took from this great blog post uh, that was done by the guys at uh, Distill.pub, um, where for a very simple data set shown on the left, um, they do TSNE visualizations varying the perplexity. Um, and the, the way to think about this perplexity is basically, you know, how many friends does each data point want to have, right? How many, how many sort of other points does it want to keep close? Uh, that's effectively what it's, what it's capturing. And so what you see is that if you set it really small, right, you say each data point only has two friends, then you'll get lots and lots of tiny little clusters, right? Whereas if you set it much bigger, uh, you're looking at sort of a different scale. Right? Uh, this is not unique to, uh, to TSNE, right? You have the same in clustering techniques, right? Where you sort of have a skill uh, parameter through the number of clusters or through, I don't know, alpha if you do some infinite mixture model, uh, et cetera. Um, and so this is something that's important to, uh, to keep in mind when you, uh, when you are working with these plots. Um, Another thing that's important is, you know, it's a, it's a non-convex objective, right? Which means that there are local minima, and there's a lot of tricks in the optimizer to try and get rid of them, but you can still sometimes see local minima, and it will typically have the following form. Uh, typically what they will do is they will split up natural clusters into multiple parts. Um, so you see some examples of that here, where, you know, some clusters were basically split up into two parts in the early stages of optimization, some other cluster moved in between, and now there's no way for these two things to get back together. That's essentially the structure of a, uh, of a local minimum. Um, and so, you know, you can see those things in, uh, in practice. Um, I should add here that it is okay to, you know, run the method multiple times and pick the best solution based on the Kubeck library divergence that it has, right? Uh, in, in the same way that maybe you run k-means multiple times and you pick the solution with the lowest mean squared error. Um, the final don't uh, that, I, that I would like to mention, uh, so this is a little bit more sort of, um, uh, sort of high level, but you're looking at sort of a low dimensional metric space, right? And there fundamentally, there are a lot of things that these spaces cannot capture. And, so, and in particular, one of the things that they cannot capture is uh, non-metric similarities, right? So the example I often use uh, for that is the example of this sand tower uh, so a sand tower is, you know, it's similar to a horse and it's similar to a man. Now, if I were to, you know, sort of, you know, take these three examples and plot them in a, in a two-dimensional metric map, um, due to the triangle inequality holding, I would conclude that, you know, horses are similar to men, right? And that is really not, not true. So there are fundamentally things that you cannot represent in a metric map like this, uh, and that's important to, uh, to keep in mind. So I'd like to conclude uh, by saying that, you know, it's, it's a valuable tool in, in mostly in generating hypotheses and, and generating understanding. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that it never produces sort of conclusive evidence, right? You cannot use it as an excuse to not do the actual science. 
Um, and in particular, you know, I went through some of the caveats in, in using this technique. Um, uh, for instance, that it has a, has a skill uh, parameter that you, know, you should be aware of, that it only reveals you know, select parts of the data and is sort of explicitly designed to remove certain other uh, parts of the data structure. Um, and, and some data structure can just never really be reflected in a low dimensional map. And with that, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks. Don't be shy. Yeah, so the, so the question is, you know, people, uh, people will use T-SNE to show that their features are becoming more discriminative. Uh, can you put a number on it? I mean, I would say, you know, the number is like the classification accuracy, right? Or like, you know, something that actually measures, you know, to what extent your, your features are discriminative, right? Like that would be one way to, to do it. And then, you know, hopefully you would even, you know, do sort of a proper statistical test to, to show that these, the differences in these accuracies are... Uh, are actually significant. Um, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I had a. I wanted to get your opinion on something. Um, I've seen very frequently people will uh, apply T-SNE and run run, uh, run a clustering algorithm on top of that, like k-means or something. Just wanted to get your opinion on. <laughs> is that <laughs> how you know how appropriate is that basically? I mean, it's it's fine, I guess. Right. It's a free world. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I think I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind, right, is it, that this is sort of a, an algorithm that you run on your data at one time. It does not do any generalization, right? It doesn't even give you a way to sort of you know take new data uh, and and put it in the, the two-dimensional map, right? Like there's no method for doing out of sample extension, right? So. Um, if you're going to use it sort of as part of a system where, you know, ultimately what you want to do is make predictions, then, you know, it's not clear to me that that makes a lot of sense. Um, if, if sort of the, you know, if the idea is to just do data analysis and the data analysis is do T-SNE and then K-means after that because, um, you know, the, the, the sort of clusters you find that way are a little bit better, then, I, I mean, I guess that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I think uh, last year there was a paper on automatic uh, selection of perplexity um, by minimizing an objective that was um, sort of loosely related to information criteria or minimum description length. Um, and I just wondered if you saw that or had any thoughts on using that kind of method. I, I have not seen it, um, but sort of based on what I've seen in the clustering literature for 25 years, I, I tend to be a bit skeptical. Like usually what these methods are doing is they're, um, you know, sort of they're taking the existing scale parameter, in this case, you know, this bandwidth or this perplexity, and they're moving it somewhere else, right? I think a nice example is sort of, you know, infinite mixture models where they will, they will maybe tell you that, oh, now you don't have to set the number of clusters anymore. It will be automatically inferred. But instead what happens is that, you know, there's some alpha parameter somewhere that basically, uh, you know, models the, you know, the probability of like adding a new, uh, a new cluster that is effectively setting the number of clusters, right? So that is effectively uh, setting the skill. So I, I, I fundamentally, I don't really think it's possible in, in part because, you know, you sort of as, as, as somebody doing the data analysis, you know, may have ideas on like what skill you're, you're interested in, right? Or, you know, you may even want to do it sort of do the analysis at multiple skills explicitly. Um, yeah, thanks. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, so my question is around how do you feel about running Disney on an actual image versus, say, a low dimensional representation of an image, um, maybe done by a deep 
metric learning algorithm. What is your opinion on that? Um, I mean, I mean, I did it right, like on the MNIST images. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you if you go to sort of you know real images like in in ImageNet, I think the you know Euclidean distance between pixel values is a very sort of uninformative mm -hmm. um, measure. So it, you know, I don't think it's going to give you much in that sense. Um, yeah. Thanks. So you mentioned thanks. Uh, so you mentioned the things don't do with TSNet. Um, Tisney. So I wonder, do you think those are the nice thing? Would it be nice to do in lower dimensional? Maybe using different tool or ex take some extra work to add on Tisney. Um, so, so you were asking about the don'ts. The don'ts. I, I mean, I think there are things to be aware of when you're interpreting these plots, mm -hmm. right? When you're interpreting these plots, I think it's important to be aware and to understand the technique that you use to create the plots. Um, because if you understand sort of the underlying technique, then you know sort of, you know, what structure in the, in the plot you're looking at is meaningful and what is just an artifact of the, of the particular uh, analysis method that you chose to use. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, let's thanks uh, Lawrence.